vlogging. The act of recording yourself with a video camera and by putting your face in front of a camera, attempting to translate some message to your viewers or hypothetical audience that could not be done otherwise in other media forms of content, such as simply writing down what you were going to say and presenting it as an essay. We're about to go wake up Rory, get our day started. Let's go see how the slumbering boy is doing. Rory. Yeah. Hey buddy. We're uh we're gonna start our day. Yeah. We're about to go out. Mm-hmm. You got anything else to say, Rory? Mm-mm. You up, dude? Come on. Get up, bro. What? Yo, dude, it's late. It's already 8.30, man. What? Dude, look. Here's your camera. Get vlogging, dude. I gotta go to debate, dude. I'm already late. Wake up, dude. Get your day started. It's already 8.30, man. I just woke up. Gotta have a productive day. What time is it? Oh, it's early. Uh, takes on the question of how one escapes a life of poverty and so about to go to campus to support my housemate in his debate tournament he just broke to finals and we're all really proud of him how does one present themselves online well it depends on the platform and the identity of choosing for the individual in question. Most active internet users have multiple platforms and the medium of presentation does alter the content. However, Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat all work on the basis of transparent identity for the vast majority of users. Allowing the audience to identify the creator and poster of content is beneficial to the creator and the audience in most scenarios. Whether people are trying to interact with their friends, or interact with their fans, or shape their public image, none of these platforms require transparency as much as assume it. For example, I have a friend on Facebook called Basil Gardenflap. This individual, or maybe a group of individuals, does not attach themselves to any known real-life identity, but interacts with a variety of Lewis and Clark and Reed students, leading most people to believe it's a student from one of these schools who made an anonymous profile for humor and entertainment. I have friends that confess that they have created profiles on Instagram, for example, with the sole purpose of publishing their esoteric art without directly linking themselves to it. If it went viral and gained a large following, they'd probably go transparent to take advantage of the monetary and influential opportunity associated with having such a large number of followers. My freshman year at Lewis and Clark, this Snapchat persona associated with sharing local partying opportunities, mainly for freshmen who are ill-informed of the party scene, would publish things to their story to let people know what houses or locations were having parties that night. And it became a huge phenomenon. Their Snapchat name was Campo Tim, named for a campus security officer who'd recently retired, who was a thorn in the side of particularly rambunctious Lewis and Clark students years prior. The identity of the individual behind the Campo Tim Snapchat was never discovered. There's something funny about vlogging in that 
I'm just pointing a camera around while speaking at it and hoping it turns out well rather than actually trying to come up with any like predetermined content or ideas or thoughts that I want to like present in a very stylized way there's something very intimate about just speaking to a camera speaking to your audience while going about your daily life on another note vlogging is quite clearly a transparent presentation of the self unless I release everything under a pseudonym while wearing a mask. <laughs> Anonymous vlogging does exist and could be successful in terms of garnering a following or gaining virality without being linked to an existing identity. However, the vast majority of vlogging is about a face in front of a camera that people tune into for the way that face generates captivating content. A good example to examine is YouTube vlogger Casey Neistat. Casey has built up a massive following through his easily digestible and visually stimulating vlogs. He has over 5 million subscribers and over 1 billion views on YouTube. I believe that Casey's success or relatable style or jealousy inducing vlogs come from his translation and presentation of new media, projects, gadgets, and concepts. Casey advocates the teach yourself style. He basically just documents himself playing with his media, capturing gadgets in a somewhat entertaining, somewhat narcissistic way, while constantly reminding you that he never went to film school or college, and is entirely self-made, self-branded. There are two varieties of Casey Neistat vlogs. One, in which he discusses his family, personal matters, stuff going on with him, your average vlog about me and my personal life, versus his other type of vlog, which generally consists of media content based around the interesting gadgets and cool entertainment industry stuff that he gets to interact with on a daily basis because of his privileged position as one of the most watched YouTube vloggers in existence. Example one. That's just a movie shoot. No one's actually getting robbed, but it sounded real. <laughs> Baby's asleep, Candace is asleep. Today on the show, we have a very, very special guest. My older son, Owen, is home from college for the first time ever. And he's only here for like a day, which is sad, but it's amazing to have him home. Candace bought these for Francine. They're just all over our house all the time. <laughs> Now, my thesis on gear is pretty straightforward. I've shared it with you a million times. I always want the very best image possible so long as it doesn't get in the way of me living my life or doing my thing. Now, what that literally means is like this. Like, when I walk into, when I walk into an airplane and I'm carrying my big vlogging camera, which looks like this, the flight attendant says, hey, you can't have that. There's no filming in here. It gets in the way. When I walk onto an airplane holding this, nobody says a thing. They just assume that I'm a nerd who likes to talk into a camera. And there are other places where you just can't bring a camera into. I just use my cell phone. That's what I mean by the best image possible as long as it doesn't get in the way. <laughs> The gist of this whole thesis is that this $5,000 camera is often not as good as this $1,500 camera. And this $1,500 camera is often not as good as this $500 camera, less good than this $200 camera. And this $200 camera, at times, is not as good as the camera on my cell phone. As far as my personal philosophy and personal hardware, I support an open system in theory. I feel as though for the user and for user interactions, Having an open system of data sharing allows the most innovation and the most creative content creation. I agree with Richard Stallman that an open system is the best for science and is the best for human progress 
and allows us all to move forward without being constrained by companies' attempts to gain profit and privatization of certain sectors of their markets. As Siva Vinayantham says in the social media reader about Richard Stallman, Richard Stallman took a stand against the propriety model long before the rest of us even realized its power and trajectory. A computer scientist working in the 1970s and 80s for the Artificial Intelligence Project at MIT, Stallman grew frustrated that computer companies were denying him and other hackers access to their source code. Stallman found that he was not allowed to improve the software and devices that he had to work with, even when they did not work well. More importantly, Stallman grew alarmed that he was becoming contractually bound to be unkind and selfish. The user agreements that accompany propriety software forbade him from sharing his tools and techniques with others. As a scientist, he was offended that openness was being criminalized. As a citizen, he was concerned that freedoms of speech and creativity were being constricted. As a problem solver, he set out to establish the Free Software Foundation to prove that good tools and technologies could emerge from a community of concerned creators. Leveraging the communicative power of technology, newsletters, and the postal system, Stallman sold tapes with his free, as in liberated, software on them. By the time enough of his constituency had connected themselves through the internet, he started coordinating projects and conversations among a diverse and distributed set of programmers. During the late 1990s, a growing team of hackers struggled to build the holy grail free software, an operating system kernel that would allow an array of programs to work in coordination. This group, led by Linus Torvalds, created a system that became known as Linux. It has, been, it has since become the chief threat to the ubiquity and dominance of Microsoft. While Linux and the GNU free software project have garnered the most attention in accounts of open source development, the protocols and programs that enable and empower email, the World Wide Web, IRC, and just about every other activity on the internet all emerge from community-based project teams, often ad hoc and amateur. And they have empowered both the growth of the propriety model and the open source model of cultural production to reach expansive new markets and audiences. interconnectedness will foster a lack of racial violence and how only opening borders could possibly begin indigenizing America and giving these people what they deserve and have deserved thousands of years, we need to end borders. As MIA said, borders. What's up with that? <laughs> However, as you can see, I've been indoctrinated into the Apple closed system to an extent. I've had this laptop for three years. I got it my senior year of high school as a gift before I left for college. It served me very well. It's one of the last computers that actually has a CD drive as well as an SD card reader, which, as far as ancient technology goes, are both pretty useful to me. It also is great for school, can run all the basic programs I need, but in terms of what it is for what it's worth, I feel like it's an overpriced piece of hardware. Most PCs allow more, I guess, high-end data access and high-end potential as far as gaming, doing stuff on the deep web, and coding, creating your own source, all have a lot more open-ended ability on the Microsoft slash Google slash PC system rather than Apple's closed stratified system. Apple encourages homogenization of media devices under its brand name with increased utility for its customers as an incentive for that reason. There are numerous examples of Apple stratifying its products and customers. iMessage carries over different Apple media devices, namely laptops, tablets, and cell phones, as well as communicating in real time with other iMessage devices and appearing blue instead of green and giving you increased utility such as read receipts. This is a funny angle. You can just see his front headlights that are 
replacement headlights that have been absolutely destroyed by his driving perfectly framed in my rear view. I guess vlogging while driving, probably not legal. Maybe not illegal, but definitely less uh, time or attention consuming than texting while driving and that I don't have to actually check the camera or what I'm recording while I'm driving. I can just focus on driving and speaking into the camera or the back of the camera in this case while you see where I'm headed and what I'm doing. Oh, I'm still recording. <laughs> you are. This is our master debater. We're so proud of him. Master debater. Hey! <laughs> Google, on the other hand, has some awesome integration of its media platforms. Google Drive slash Google Docs has taken over academic and work organization for many. The utility and ease of use over various devices the fact that you can access documents on any device that has internet access. I access Google Docs on my Apple PC and then switch over to my housemate's desktop to access the same Google Doc to print and work on it further. I suppose my choice of device as far as my laptop does not align with my view of open slash closed web and of open slash closed access to content. However, I think Apple is a very unique company and that although their goal is very much ultimately profit driven and they have always been a very smart privatized company, the devices that they create are so ubiquitous and are so common in terms of, I guess, the gentry and everyone of wealth possessing them and using them that I know very few people that don't own a single Apple device or did at one time. I used to own an iPhone, and once the cost of replacing an iPhone got too expensive, I switched over to Samsung simply because my parents were willing to pay for it when I did stuff like this and cracked my camera screen. Apple, on the other hand, charges exorbitant prices for any types of repairs or replacements, and I guess it makes sense. iPhones are a pretty remarkable product that people are willing to pay for, and so Apple takes advantage of that. And the same concept applies to their laptops and tablets as well. The brand name, in addition to a certain guarantee of functionality, allows Apple to charge what it wants and what it knows people are willing to pay, even though that price might be slightly higher than the actual ability or utility of the function that device gained as opposed to other Microsoft or Google devices. A good example is the Google Chromebook. The Google Chromebook is a $300 laptop that although it only has application function for Google Apps, which is extremely limited, you have Drive, Chrome, those devices are so comprehensive in terms of homework, watching things on the internet, and doing all of 99% of the function that I would use on this laptop anyway, while being a fourth of the price, that it seems as though the Chromebook is perfect for users who are attempting to get a laptop solely for school purposes. Okay, now look, I know this is like kind of a backluster option, but what do you think of um, Baja Brand? Most professional vloggers were not always vloggers but got their start from some other angle of the entertainment industry. Roman Atwood, possibly the most successful YouTube vlogger of all time, with almost 10 million subscribers and over two and a quarter billion views, began as a prankster that moved into vlogging after gaining notoriety from his prank vids. His vlogs, just like many of the other biggest vloggers, mostly involve the use of expensive cars, toys, transportation, and leisure. It's like an intimate view into what the life of the uber-wealthy celebrity is like. The content of the vlogs give off a very particular aesthetic, that of a high-energy, privileged lifestyle, which is ironically perpetuated and paid for by continuous vlog money. Another example of a successful vlogger in this mold is Tanner Fox. 
A 16-year-old professional scoots person and vlogger, Fox has gained massive success through his appeal to a younger audience. It seems the success and this mold are correlated. But does the energy slash aesthetic bring success, or does the success bring the aesthetic? In my opinion, the most notorious vloggers, basically the vloggers I've heard of, or have heard of friends, or people on the internet watching frequently, have almost exclusively been men. I felt as though my vlog exposure was somewhat gendered, and researched the most popular and successful female vloggers. Of all the most successful women vloggers, I had only heard of one, YouTube Inceptor Jenna Marbles. I did some further research into why this may be. Why had I only heard of one of the most successful female vloggers of the many successful female YouTube vloggers? Well, I concluded it was content driven. Much of the content of YouTube's most successful female stars is makeup, beauty, personal upkeep, and other gendered content that doesn't appeal to me or my demographic. And as a result, it's almost as though much of the most successful vloggers appeal to people of the same gender background as themselves. Is that the reason why I had so thoroughly heard of Casey Neistat and Roman Atwood and these other male prank or entertainment stars who turned that success into vlogging? Well, I have a few female friends at least who are pretty into Casey Neistat, and I feel like his popularity transcends gender boundaries. So does Jenna Marbles, perhaps. And yet, vlogging and the content involved in vlogging is so personal and so intimate that on a daily basis, most of the vlogs for most female vlog stars are simply things that I wouldn't watch unless I was otherwise researching them for the sake of researching vlogs. And I think this is the heart of the gender divide regarding vlogs. I think I'm gonna take the short cut. It's a long, it's a long cut from here. Fine, because of the fact that we have a red light on our hands. I think it's worth it. I think you might be right. How's your visibility? Pretty poor, dude. Over the course of this day, I wanted to examine what a day in the life of an examined vlog would be like. Things like vaping, the clothes I was wearing, and choosing to vlog while driving were all attempts to appeal and mimic this vlog aesthetic displayed by the most popular vloggers on YouTube.
In conclusion, I've decided to start vlogging. My housemate Noah and I are narcissistic enough to think we're interesting enough for the masses to watch us on the internet. While we may not make a living making meta-vlogs satirizing the neoliberal point of view of vlog culture, at least we can analyze the cognitive dissonance on display in taking advantage of the open web as a platform for promoting an entertainment brand while profiting off of the privatization of that same brand. Make it work now and just like see if we can uh, raise success and invest in the bigger vlogs better.